Open your Bibles. We're going to pick up where I left off last week, Isaiah chapter 55. You, you know, um, I, I realize that we're not under the old covenant, but what we need to realize is that a lot of the new, co- a lot of the old covenant promises, they are still in effect today. The promises and the blessings and the provisions of the old covenant are not done away with because the Bible says, I am the Lord and I change not. Now, what has changed is that the types, the shadows, the illustrations of the coming Messiah has been fulfilled in Jesus. For, for in other words, the, basically a lot of the things that they were required to do in the book of Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy, it's done away with. Uh, no more animal sacrifices. Uh, no more fear of mixing your different types of clothes together. You know, they couldn't mix cotton and linen. They couldn't mix certain kinds of clothes No more concern about what kind of animals you can eat because Paul said in Timothy, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So that means you can eat pork. Now I realize there are people in in this generation that are still, they're still caught up in some of the old Levitical teachings. But you know, we, we were Gentiles and we're not underneath Uh, the old mosaic law we're underneath the new covenant okay so I'm going to believe what Paul said I'm going to believe what Jesus said I'm going to believe what Peter said I'm going to believe what the New Testament says and uh, I believe a lot of these teachings that people are doing now don't misunderstand me we can study the old covenant and we can study the feast days we can study the Passover because it was a typology of Christ and you can learn a lot you can study the year of Jubilee you can study uh, the tabernacle and the temple and all of the animal sacrifices and there's a lot because I've done some teachings of the old covenant and and used it as an illustration a type of shadow uh, something you could learn from but I don't have to observe them because my, my, all that I need is found in Jesus. In him I live and move and have my being. And I've had friends of mine, and I know people personally, that they get caught up in to trying to keep, well, if you, matter of fact, in J, Galatians it says, if you break one of those traditions, you, break, you broke the whole law. So if you're trying to uh, uh, obtain uh, some kind of spiritual maturity or you're trying to obtain some kind of righteousness by the keeping of the law, you might as well just stop because you've got to keep it all. And remember, one of the major things they had to do was animal sacrifices. Now, now, how many of you, when's the last time you committed an animal sacrifice unto God? Now, I, I don't really, now, whatever you do, do you, you do it as unto the Lord. So I, I do eat that steak unto the Lord, but I'm not, I'm not building an altar, and I'm not, you know, catching the blood in a bowl, and I'm not sprinkling the lamb, the blood of the lamb, and a doorpost and a lintel. Jesus took care of all that for me. But the old covenant is packed full of amazing promises and blessings and provisions and protection. A thousand have fought my left and 10,000 at my right. It'll not come nigh my dwelling. How many know Psalms 91? Abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that wonderful? How, how, how about, you know, Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Isn't that wonderful? And so we can, we can go ahead and take a hold of these realities and memorize these scriptures and meditate upon these scriptures and, and get these things deep within our heart because I'm amazed at the revelation that the Old Testament prophets had. Uh, and, and the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But, you know, I, I, I'm constantly um, overwhelmed with how profound the word of God is. You know, the word of God is eternal. Uh, heaven or shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And this book will never pass away. It will be fulfilled, but it will never pass away. It will all, because it's a part of God. You know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was something made that was made. See, the word created all things. The word what was, was the, the second part of the triunity of God, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And, of course, then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, people say, you know, because Jesus said, Verily, verily, I send to you, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You say, well, how can we eat the flesh of Jesus? Well, listen, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. How, how do you eat the flesh of Jesus? You eat his Word. He, he said, uh, the psalmist said, thy words were found, and I did eat them, 
and they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. We eat the word of God through our eye gate and our ear gate. We eat the word of God. And then we're transformed, changed by that word. You know, it, 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 all, all, you know every, anytime we can't get the victory, the truth of the matter is it's a lack of faith. Now, when I say lack of faith, right away some people can get offended, but really lack of faith is nothing but lack of the word, isn't it? That's really what it is. It's a lack of the word of God within your heart, not in your head. It's got to be the word that's quickened by the Holy Spirit. But Isaiah is speaking by the Spirit of God in chapter 55, and he begins to say some amazing things in verse 1. Whole, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. We talked about this last week, that their, 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 their finances, now yes, God's going to lead us to give, and we got to be good stewards over what we have, but really, this has never been about money, though where your treasure is, your heart is also. But really, it's not about money, it's about your heart, isn't it? And really, you don't have to have money to purchase anything that God has for you. But you do have to have faith. You must have faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. And, you know, I, I know without a shadow of a doubt, and it grieves me to say this, I know that I'm living way below what God has for me. Most likely, you are too. Because there's no end to what God can do. So even Paul himself felt like he was living below what God had for him. And that's why he said in Philippians, he, 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 what he said, I have not yet apprehended all that I have been apprehended for. Now, I've actually run into people who, who, who just foolishly uh, said that they, 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 they had no sin. Well, well, what are you talking about sin? Now, if you're talking about the, the, the sins, according to Galatians 5 and also in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, and they that do such things shall not inherit eternal life, I can accept that. You know, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Okay, well, absolutely you ought to be living without that. But, you know, the Bible says anything that is not of faith is sin. Well, the only one who really got to a place where they were pure, 100% faith all the time in every situation was Jesus Christ. Now, it's something we need to apprehend. We need to believe God for. We need to grow from glory to glory, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. I, I want to grow every day. Now, now we, what we, we find, though, stark reality is, though, we have an enemy, don't we? We have the world, the flesh, our flesh, and the devil. And as long as we're in this world, they're going to go contrary to God's will. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't realize that the enemy was constantly coming against Jesus. And, and, you know, a lot of times, and we don't know how many times, but when Jesus would get into a boat to go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and I, I, I've been to the Sea of Galilee, and all of a sudden there, the Bible says there would be a contrary wind that would rise up. And, and, and the disciples, they'd be rowing all night long. That one time the boat almost got filled and they woke Jesus up because they, they thought they were going to drown. And Jesus did what they should have done. He rose up and he spoke to the contrary wind. And he told it to stop and the waves to cease. Now, do you know the disciples could have done the same thing? But it didn't come into their carnal mind. See, our, our natural mind doesn't think that way. See, the minute the enemy attacks you mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, you ought to be taking authority over it. Now, we're not devil conscious. That doesn't mean you go on and on and on about the devil, but you take authority over it. Pain hits your body. You come against it. You say, in the name of Jesus, I command that pain to come out, and I command it to go. Now, really, I don't have, a, 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 you know, some people are very curious you know, they got a curious mind, and so they get a little twitch, they get a little pain, they get a little symptom, they get a little manifestation of something wrong, and right away they run and run off to the doctors, and they want to find out what the doctors have to say. I, I, I'm totally oblivious to that kind of stuff. I don't care what the doctors have to say, because I have a doctor. I have a family doctor. He's the great physician. His name is Jesus. 
And so the minute whatever kind of pain or symptom or problem hits my body, and, and you know, I'm so glad I purposely, you know, years ago, because a lot of the ministers, uh, some of them I've known and I watch them, and they'll begin to call out all these technical words for certain physical problems. And I got to thinking I had to do that myself in order for I could minister to people. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And, and he took me back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he showed me because I have a hero. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and my hero never did that. My, my hero, I'm sure they had names for certain ailments in those days, but my hero never memorized all those long technical words. You know, the other day, just for fun, yeah, I don't know if you ever, I go, hey, Google, and, and, and so my son Daniel and I, we had to go uh, do some work at someone's house, and we're coming back, and I said, Dan, ask it what the longest uh, uh, word there is in, 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 in history or in America, and this, they said to say this word, listen, I'm not exaggerating, to say this word properly from beginning to end, a word would take you three hours. I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, what, what is it? He said, it was a medical word. The medical world created a word for a certain kind of affliction that for you to say that word from beginning to end correctly would take you three hours. Now, can you imagine if I thought I had to name the name of the disease you had and you had that disease? I'd be standing here for three hours saying you have blah, 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 for three hours. And then I'd say, come out. Well, I'm so glad I could just tell that spirit of infirmity, come out. And, I, and, and, you know, I've got a book back there called The Expert's Handbook of Casting Out Devils or Exorcism. And, and, and don't be swallowed up with the lie that you've got to know the names of all the devils. They said, well, Jesus did. No, no, no. One time he said to the man in, in the Gadareans, he said, uh, who are you? And they said, we are legion. That means many. It could be up to 2,000, 10,000. We are legion. We are many. And so Jesus, he always called them unclean spirits. And so 99% of the time, unless the Lord shows me, it's a spirit of deafness or a spirit of blindness. So you can use whatever the physical problem is too. You spirit of cancer come out. You can do that. But really, you don't need to. You can just tell the spirit of infirmity to come out in Jesus' name. Aren't you glad you got authority and power? I mean, we've got authority and power. Praise the Lord, we've got authority. But Isaiah, he, he had such revelation of God, and we gave you scriptures, but really in the beginning he's saying, really, he's talking to people that are thirsty and that are hungry and that are desperate for God. You know, in the Middle East, one of the greatest needs they have is water. And so this is what Isaiah the prophet saying. As a matter of fact, in the Old Covenant, when people would get involved in sin, the very first thing that would happen is that it would stop raining. I, I heard the other day that they've had a drought out west in some of those areas, in Arizona and, and Wyoming, they've had a drought from 10 to 20 years. You know, they can't even run the Hoover Dam. They can't even run the power station there anymore because the, the Lake Mead is all dried up. Now, in the old days, our, 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 we had spiritual men in positions of authority, politicians, and they would call their state to repentance. Do you know that? Now, now we just say, well, you know, it's, it's, global, it's global warming. No, it ain't. It's sin. It's sin. What did Elijah do? He said it will not rain upon the space of the earth for three and a half years. And then he prayed and because the people repented. When did the rain come? When the people repented. Praise the Lord for that. So, but, you know, today I guess we don't have that spiritual wisdom, that spiritual understanding to connect the dots and cross the T's and realize that a lot of the things that are going on in society is because of sin. But the very first thing we need as people, the, very, the most precious thing you have in your life, listen to me, is your hunger and your thirst for God. Whatever you do, do not lose your hunger, your thirst, your desperation for God. And the, the way we lose it is by partaking of what the world has to offer us when it's against the will of God. Or you can get caught up in hobbies. You can, for notes, we all have a hunger and thirst and a desire, but you have to determine what you want it to be. I choose to make it God. 
I choose to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be desperate. I'm constantly, daily, daily, for the last 47 years, 365 days out of the year, I'm trying to stir that hunger up inside of me. Now, there's times I'm more hungry than other times, and there's times I'm less hungry for God. But really, I wish I would just be just like absolutely, you know, thirsty for God 100%. Like a deer in, 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 uh, panting for the water brook in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So, ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Buy wine and milk without money, without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. For in other words, don't spend your life and right now, it is so easy on things that have no meaning, just dead-end alleys. I mean, you pour your life into stuff that has no meaning. Now, I'm not talking about fellowshipping with brothers and sisters. I'm not talking about, you know, sharing the gospel with people. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to work and make a living because the Bible says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. So it's all within context. But, you know, I found out even my, in my walk with God, there's things that, that, and I'm the kind of guy, I'm really dangerous because I get an idea in my head and I begin to do it. I'm just that kind of guy. I got a silly thing in my head to make myself my own flying machine. I built myself, you know, I used to be a pilot and I stopped flying, so I made my own little flying machine. And I'm coming across the backfield one day. My, my boys were helping me, my three boys, and I'm coming off the ground. And as I'm coming off the ground in this homemade flying machine, this ultralight per se, I heard the Lord say, you're a dead man. <laughs> I, I slammed off the throttle. I came down off of the bank. I mean, I'm up in the air. I hit the ground, and my, my, my muffler fell off. It was a snowmobile engine I used, and it hit the prop. I got a book back there called I Need God Because I'm Stupid, 83 stories <laughs> that, that I've missed God since I've been saved. <laughs> and, and, I, and I really struggled with writing that book. I said, Lord, I don't want to write this book. He said, you got to because it'll pop your bubble. It'll keep you straight. And, and it will help people because they're going to find out you're not perfect. They're going to read your other books, and they're going to go, wow, this guy's amazing. Look at the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the protection, the healing. He says, I want you to write that book, and, it's gonna, and, and they're going to read that book, and they're not going to get discouraged then. They're going to say, well, Pastor Mike, he, he's really done a lot of dumb stuff. <laughs> Any of you ever do a lot of dumb stuff? Man, I've done a lot of dumb stuff. Thank God for his mercy. You know, that's one way that faith comes. Faith cometh by not just hearing, but faith comes by crying out for mercy. I say, God, have mercy on me. I can't tell you how many times I've had to cry out to God for mercy, and, and God has mercy on me. Aren't you glad for his mercy? In the old covenant, they used to say, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. And that's when the glory of God would come. Oh, grab, reach up and grab God's mercy. Don't you need God's mercy today? Oh, hallelujah. So we're in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 3. He says, incline your ear and come on to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David. Now we know this is all prophetic because really the covenant that God is, yeah, I have some more. The, 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 the mercy, that, that the covenant that God has created for us is his son Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank God for Jesus. By his blood, by his body, we've been redeemed, we've been delivered, we've been set free, we've been ransomed. We're, 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 we're heirs and joint heirs, we're more than conquerors, we're more than kings, we're overcomers. And so what, what wonderful promises we have. You know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Did you know that? And joy is not, you know, joy produces emotions. I mean, joy does. Uh, joy, joy is more than just a deep satisfaction in your heart. It's more than that. It's, it's way more than that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's your strength. You, you, you know, a lot of Christians today, they walk around like they've been weaned on, uh, on dill pickle juice or on lemons. 
I mean, they're all, their faces are all crunched up. And I mean, really, it looks like they're, 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 they're constipated. I just hate to say that. They look like they're constipated. <laughs> you know, help us, Jesus. So tonight's a little bit of joy here. In verse 3, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. So we got to open up our hearts and our minds. You know, it, it says, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Oh, I'm telling you what, I'm so glad that I discovered as a 19-year-old kid that the most important reality for me was hiding God's word in my heart. Amen. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all thy day. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing in my heart. For I'm called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I, I, I really, really at this moment, I don't think much of the body of Christ has had the revelation of the power that is in the word of God in a human heart. Man should not live by bread alone. He told in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is God speaking through Moses to the second generation. The first generation have all died off because they never would mix faith with the word of God. They would not mix faith with the word of God. In Hebrews, it gets into that in great detail. But he tells the second generation, he said, listen, I had to leave you in the wilderness for 40 years. For you could learn one simple truth, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, I've been walking with the Lord for over 47 years. And you know, I have some of that reality, but I don't have enough of it. I, I just don't have enough of it. You know, I, I, I just, you might, I'm not really a fan of Smith Wigglesworth, but I, I have written over 50 books about Smith. And <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, 50 books. I'm not a fan of Smith. But, but I'll tell you what I loved about Smith's life. He was simply a plumber, but Smith had an advantage because when he was a young boy, his daddy took him out of school to work in a factory because in order, and we don't live in those kind of days in America, in order for that family to survive through winter, he grew up in Wales. I've been to Wales many times in Great Britain and Scotland and in, 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 in England. But in order for them to survive, in order to pay their rent and keep their house seated and to keep food on their table and keep clothes on their back, they all had to work. So Smith never got an education. Well, he got gloriously born again when he was eight years old at his, I think it's his grandma's Methodist church. And uh, so he, uh, he, he, years later, because he was always a soul winner, but though he had a terrible speech impediment, because he was like his mother, he would repeat the same word maybe uh, ten, ten times over before he could get it out. And, and yet, when, and when he, he could share Christ with people, and he was a real soul winner. But he ran into a young girl whose name was Polly, who was 16 years old. And uh, she was an evangelist, a young girl evangelist with the Salvation Army. And matter of fact, William Booth, when he met her, he was so impressed that he actually uh, put her into a position of leadership as a 17-year-old girl. And his wife was the preacher, and so she taught Smith how to read. And all he ever read was the Bible. That's it. So, so I don't know when he met her, probably when he was 16 years old, right around there. And so from 16 to 48 years old, all he had ever read, now he was a plumber, he was trained by another plumber, and they didn't have to read materials, they, they taught him on the job, and he became a good plumber. But during those, f up to 48 years old, he never really seen a lot of signs, wonders, or miracles. I mean, he had answered prayers, he'd lead, he'd lead people to Jesus, and he'd seen moves of God. But, but when he was turned 48, he heard about people being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, and in his mind, see, this is why doctrine is so important. In his mind, he already had the Holy Ghost. And so he heard they were getting the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. So he went to the meeting, and he actually went there to argue with him. 
And he was there for three days arguing with these people. I got the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. And here they are. They're speaking in tongues. He finally went to uh, the, the preacher's house. Uh, when he, before he went back to go to his own business, wherever he was located, you know, and he went into the preacher's house, fell on his knees. He said, I'm not leaving until I get the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues. And as he, his knees hit the floor, he got filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Well, from that moment forward, his life was never the same. But this is what happened. All of the word of God that he had hid in his heart was now quickened by the power of the Holy Ghost. And Smith began to walk into a realm where most people can only imagine. I mean, just miracle after miracle until he went home to be with Jesus when he was 87 years old. Just amazing miracles. But it wasn't because he was an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. It was because his wife was the pastor. It was because of the fact that he had hid the word of God in his heart. And when he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, the word of God was quickened to his heart. And you know, Jesus said, it is the, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's the spirit that quickeneth and the flesh profiteth nothing. See, we, we are desperate. We are, in a, we are in a time of great famine in the body of Christ where the word of God is not being hid in the heart and, 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 and it's not being quickened because if that word of God is not in your heart, it can't be quickened. It's like a bag of seeds. You can have the best seeds of whatever kind of plant you want to plant, but until you get that seed into the soil, until it's watered, until the heat of the sun comes and it's germinated, until it's quick, and it will never produce. God's word ain't going to produce in your head. See, well, how do I know if the word of God is alive in my heart? Because if it's alive, faith begins to rise up in you. And faith, what is faith? Faith is when you know that you know that you know that you know that you know it's done. I mean, nobody tells you, nobody has to tell you that you're healed. Now, when you're moving in a gift of healing and miracles and faith, I've done that many times as the Spirit of God moved me in that way. And actually, I've seen a lot of people, I've seen sinners who didn't even believe in God get healed because I was moving in the gift of faith or healings or, or, or gift of miracles. And, and, and I remember one time I was preaching in a tent in the Huntington Fair back in about 1981. And as I'm preaching, I'm watching a man who's walking by on Christ. And up out of my mouth, it just flows like a river. I said to the young man, I had a PA system, and there was lots of people in that Huntington Fair. And I said, I said, you, young sir, walking with those crutches. And he turned and looked at me. I said, come up here, and God will heal you right now. Well, he ignored me. So it took about three or four times, and everybody's staring at him. So he finally comes up, you know, and I said, when I lay my hands on you, do you believe that God's going to heal you? And he was offended. He said, you're the one who called me up here. You know, but I'm moving in the gift of faith, in the gift of healings, you know. And so I didn't even ask him what was wrong with his knee. I just, it, it, I, it was his, I believe it was his left leg. And, and, and I laid my hands on him and I commanded him to be healed. I said, okay, now throw down your crutches and begin to walk. He looked at me like I lost my mind. Everybody in my tent was watching this, and my wife was there and some co-workers. And without me knowing what I was doing, I grabbed a hold of his crutches. I pulled him away. I spun him around, and I shoved him. I mean, I gave him a big shove. He took off stumbling down the, saw, uh, the sawdust trail. And, but as he did, as he did, all of a sudden, I could tell that God had done something. And all of a sudden, he's moving his legs. He turns around. He begins to almost weep. And I said, come up here now and tell us what God did. He said, he said, you don't understand, you don't understand. I said, what's that? He said, this last winter I was walking on a sidewalk that was covered in ice. He said, and I slipped and I fell down on that knee. He said, that knee was totally destroyed and within a couple of weeks they're going to do a knee operation. They're going to replace that kneecap. And, and he said, but I'm healed, I'm healed. I said, okay. I said, I want you now to go back to your doctors. Let them examine it and come back and give us the report. And he came back a couple of days later. And he said, I walked into my doctor's office and they saw me coming in without the crutch or without no help. And they said to me, what happened to you? And he said, I told him the story. He said, they x-rayed my knee. He said, I got a brand new kneecap. Yeah, 
Now, I love that. I love that when the gift of faith is operating. But faith is when you know that you know that you know. I could tell you some radical stories that when the gift of faith was in me for my own personal healing. And I know when we put up this building, this is one of the radical stories. One day we had the crane. And I, I'm just a little guy. And the rest of the time we had to carry those heavy steel girders and purlings and put them in place back in 1986. And as I did, I tore my stomach lining and I, I got a terrible hernia well I began to pray over it you know but not really aggressively I wasn't really taking what's mine how many know that healing is yours yes. you got to take it yes. you got to take it just take it I don't I don't I have a book back there it's called faith that will not take no for an answer filled oh. with stories when I was confronted with situations where in the natural it looked like I wasn't going to get healed or get my prayers answered now, I'm not demanding God to do it I'm believing he's done it and I'm just coming against the devil and so about two, three years went by. I thought it was three years. My wife thought it was two. And now this hernia is really, it's, it's really coming out. And it's beginning to get strangled a little bit. But see, I don't have a spirit of fear, but a power of love in this on mine. I, I just don't think the way that normal people think. You know, I just don't. I, I just don't, you know, since 1975, uh, since I gave my heart to Christ, when, when the devil attacks me with some kind of physical illness, I, the thought don't even come to my head to go to a medical doctor. I go to Jesus. I just don't think that way, you know. And, and so uh, I, I, I said, okay, I believe I'm healed. I believe this hernia is healed. I believe my stomach lining is healed. I said, now i got to act out my faith. What am I going to do? And it came to me, well, it, it's, it's just hanging there. And so I'll, I'll, do, I'll take my finger and I'm going to shove it back up into its cavity. <laughs> and so I did. I shoved it up. I went, oh, in the name of Jesus. And, and, and after about maybe 20, 30 minutes, it'd come back out, and I'd shove it again. And, and then it'd come out, and I'd shove it again. Yes. Now, I did this all day long. I did this for a whole day, and then another day, and another day. I did this for two weeks. Every day, it'd come out, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You, you know, you see those guys on TV, they're walking around, they're cupping their hands. They really saw me do that. That's how they got that. You know, they don't know what I was doing. They just saw me. They were driving down the road one day, some people in the car, and they saw me going like this, and they said, hey, that looks pretty neat. I think I'll do that, you know. But it just teased But you know what? I did that for two weeks. Listen, I went to bed one night, and I got up the next morning, and it was all gone. I was healed. I mean, we're, we're talking back in about 1989. All these years, I was healed. Why? Because I know that 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 I know. That's what faith is. Faith is when the word of God becomes more real to you than your physical problems. You know, you know the Bible says, casting all your care upon the Lord because he careth for you. Well, a lot of people can't cast their care on the Lord because they really don't believe that God cares. See? They, they can't go to, I mean, there's been many a night when I went to bed, and, and in this building, we've been uh, pastoring here for 40 years now, been in this building since 1986. There was many times when it looked like we were goners, and I don't raise money. I mean, I went from 700 people down to only my family for a while, and I, I wasn't being able to keep the, pay the electric and, 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 and pay the mortgage and pay the insurance. And what'd you do, Pastor Mike? I cried out to God. I said, God, you put me here. I know you're going to take care of us. Now, Lord, I didn't send out no email, panicking email. If you don't help us, we're going to sink, blah, 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 blah. No, why? Because God's my source. See, God's my provider. He, he's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. And, 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 and you know what? God's always come through. I mean, supernaturally, miraculously. Back about maybe, I guess it was eight years ago, it was a real bad winter. I, I didn't have no pellet stoves, wood stoves, or solar heating like I have now up in the building. And I came in here one Sunday morning, and, and, and I turned on the heat. And I, and I know when the LP tank is running out, I had a 1,000-gallon LP tank. I could smell the LP. I could smell it. I said, okay, we didn't have any money. I'm telling you, we didn't have any money. I'm just believing God day to day, you know, which is okay. I could go to sleep at night because God's my source. So I went out in the snow. I laid my hands on that 1,000-gallon tank. I said, now, Lord, until you bring in the finances, we need to keep this tank producing fuel. How many know that tanks don't produce fuel? But don't tell me that. 
So I just, I, I just began to thank God. I said, Lord, I thank you that we're going to heat this building until you bring in the money. I came in, turned on all the heaters, and this time they came on, and, and, and there was no smell of garlic. Well, that Sunday morning, the congregation came, and I preached, and Sunday night preached, and Thursday night preached. Next Sunday morning, turned on the heat. I went out there, and the tank was empty. I know when the tank's empty. We run out of fuel here many times, and it was empty. And so I said to the congregation, I said, now I'm going to show you a miracle. You're going to see that God's done a miracle. I said, put your winter coats on. There's probably about 20, 30 of us. I said, come on, march out here. So we all marched out there and looked at an empty LP tank, and we did that for the next two and a half months. Praise the Lord. Lord for two and a half months they all saw and they all felt the heat coming from a tank that had no fuel <laughs> but the Bible says let it be done to you according to your faith and so he's trying to build up their faith in Isaiah 55 he's trying to get them to see the reality so he's telling them to listen that I've made a covenant with you behold I have given him for a witness to the people a leader and a commander to the people verse 5 behold thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified thee and what he's talking about is the, 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 the Gentiles coming into the kingdom after the day of Pentecost you know, as far as I know, we don't have any Jewish blood in us other than through the new covenant and the blood of Jesus. And so I come out of a Gentile background. And he says a nation will be born overnight. That's what happened. The Gentiles came into the kingdom. And the Jewish people didn't realize that was a part of God's plan, though it was prophesied about. In verse, the ver next verse, uh, in verse 6, seek, do what? Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now, in the New Covenant, it says God's not very far from any one of us. He, he, as a matter of fact, as a believer, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. See, you've got to get this deep in your heart. If you, you, well, I just feel like God forsook me. No, he didn't forsake you. He loves you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you all the time. You don't have to ask him to go with you in the car. He's with you. Wherever you go, he's with you. I remember I first got born again, and when I got born again, I did. I experienced God's glory. Some people call it God's presence, whatever you want to call it. But, I mean, it was just overwhelming, overwhelming. His presence on me was so strong for the first month I was saved, I could barely stand it. It was just like, you know, and, and you know, and, but one morning I got up, and that, that, that feeling of his presence was gone. I mean, just gone. I mean, gone, like I'd never got saved. And so I had to decide, what am I going to do? Am I, am, am I going to, and I didn't know it was called at that time, am I going to walk by faith or walk by my feelings? And I decided I was going to walk by faith, though I didn't know that's what it was called. I said, well, I checked my heart, it was okay, so I did. I just kept seeking God and seeking God. This went on, to make a long story short, this thing went on for two weeks. I did not feel per se, God's presence. Now, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say feeling God's presence, right? Because you can feel God's presence. <laughs> you, can, you can feel God's presence. I mean, God's glory can come on you. <laughs> it can. It can come on you. It can, it can, I love it when God's presence comes. I mean, God's glory. God's glory will come upon you. And, and, and we've seen the whole congregation just wiped out in the Holy Ghost many a times. But anyways, so two weeks go by, and I, I, I don't have that bubbling feeling. I don't have that joy. I don't have that, you know, the touch of God in my life. But I'm just seeking God. And all of a sudden, one morning I got up, and I'm telling you what, it was a tsunami. God hit me. Boom. Hit me. I went, whoa. And I'm laughing. I'm crying. I'm shouting. You know, I'm all by myself, but it's me and Jesus, you know. And I, and, and, I, and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I swear have you been for the last two weeks? And this is what he spoke to my heart. He says, I've been here all the time. I said, what? I said, Lord, what was that all about? He says, I'm teaching you how to walk by faith. See, I'm so glad I learned that because there's been times in my life it felt like I knew I was seeking God, I was praying, I was believing, but it, there was just times I felt like I was cursed, see, but I wasn't cursed. It was just the devil messing with me. We don't wrestle flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. But he tells me, you seek the Lord, draw nigh to God and he will 
draw nigh to you. There's a promise. He grabbed the promises. We overcome this world by the exceeding great and precious promises given to us by God's word. Every, I mean, I live by the promises. I take a hold of the promises of God, and I'm not telling God, God, you got to keep your promise. I don't have to tell him that because he keeps his promises. How many know that God keeps his promises? How, how many have ever had a promise you took a hold of and God kept it, right? God kept it for you. He always keeps his promises, but our job is to believe, to believe, no matter what. But, but now I'm not telling you that if you're not believing, just ignore the problem. I'm saying what you got to do is you got to go deeper into God and get that reality into your heart. Yes. There's been times when I knew in my heart I wasn't operating in faith. And I had to get more of the word of God in my heart. And one thing I did a lot of times is I cried out for mercy. Say mercy. Oh, I'm telling you many times when it looked like everything was gone I just, and I knew I was not operating in faith. I said, mercy. God have mercy. Lord. And I would tell the Lord this. I would say, Lord. If I was you and you were me and I were in the, if you were in the mess that I am in, I'd help you. That's what I tell the Lord. And, and really, I didn't need to tell him that, but I tell the Lord. I said, Lord, if, I, if you were in the mess that I'm in right now and if I, and if I could help you uh, and you were in that mess, I'd help you. I said, Lord, help me. And he always has. He, he, he's an ever-present help in a time of trouble. And if you ever have times of trouble... Now, the Bible says many other afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them, them all. He delivers them. So it says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And, and then it gives us instructions because really what's going on among the Jewish people is they, they, they backslid. And I think really to a great extent right now, the body of Christ has backslid to a great extent. Caught up in the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of the eyes, the lust of, the, uh, of life, the pride of life, the cares of this world. Just swallow them up. You know, technology is wonderful, and you can use it for God. I use it for God all the time, but you don't let the technology get a hold of you and mess you up. Use it for God's glory. But it says, listen, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his what? His thoughts. It's all right here. It's in your head. As a man thinketh, you know, uh, how, how many of you have an Android phone? Any of you have it? How many have an Apple phone? Any of you have an Apple phone? Okay. Well, we got, we got two different, we got two different operating systems. Now, I'm not saying one's of God and one's not. But I, I'm just saying that, that that has an operating system. And the world has their own operating system. But we as God's people have our operating system. And before, you might say this, before I got born again, I was operating neat like, like, like a, an Android, but then I became an iPhone. <laughs> I, I just, don't be offended because I have an Android. I'm just saying I had to change my operating system. And the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So when you get born again, if you get born again late in life, then you know what? You have a lot of, 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 of junk inside of your thoughts and your mind that you've been taught, trained, educated in the religious world, in the secular world, in, the, in every area. And anything that is against the will of God, it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So I've got to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I've got to get a new operating system. Now the good news is at, a, at my 19th birthday, I didn't have a lot up there. I really didn't have a lot up there. I was not really a thinker. But when I got born again, I grabbed my little military Bible and I began to eat and drink the word of God. I mean, they just ate it and drank it and ate it and drank it. I'm not exaggerating. Ate it and drank it, ate it and drank it. And as I was hiding the word of God in my heart, I didn't realize it, but I was changing out my old operating system into a new operating system. And so when the enemy would show up or circumstances would happen to me or problems would come along or, or dangerous situations where it looked like I was going to die, like when the, 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 the gang leaders in Chicago tried to kill me or the Yupik Indians tried to burn me to death or the communists in the Philippines, they, they were there with their machetes and their guns and they were going to uh, cut me down like the last missionaries they did. But when I jumped out of that canoe and headed right into that crowd of 30 communists, new people, 
people's army standing with their machetes and their guns. They split like the Red Sea, and we still have a church there to this day. See, because I don't operate like the world operates. I don't operate. I don't have a spirit of fear. When this COVID hit, I didn't mock it because I know that people are dying from COVID. They're dying from cancer. They're dying. But we don't have to. See, we don't have to. I mean, greater is he that is in it than he that's in the world. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I have, I don't, I'm not afraid of cancer. I'm not afraid of COVID. I'm not afraid of disease. I mean, I've, take, I've gone to places where I would not take people with me because I knew that they couldn't handle it. But, but see, I knew that I knew that I knew God was with me. And if God before me, who can be against me? But see, we can develop our faith to this degree. And how do we do it? We got to, first of all, forsake the old life. We got to repent of it. We got to acknowledge it. You know, there, you know, it says, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. You know, the problem is, I don't think a lot of people in the body of Christ understands that. What, repent for what, Pastor Mike? Well, repent for believing what the devil's telling you. I, I preached a sermon on Sunday. I'll probably go into this Sunday about the truth and the lie. Jesus said, I am the truth and the devil's nothing but a lie. He's a liar. Now, that doesn't mean that the, 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 the physical sickness doesn't exist and danger. No, no, but, but this world is under gross darkness right now. There's, it, 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 it's bought the lie. We're in a time of gross darkness. But, but Jesus is the light of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the light. See, and I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus over my circumstances. I believe Jesus over the government. I believe Jesus over the medical world. I believe Jesus over the insurance world. I, I, I'm not telling you to do this, but I was passing a, a never had health insurance. I guess when I was in the Navy, I did. But my wife and I pastored a little Assembly of God church in 19, uh, I think we began there at the end of 79 and left in uh, the summer of 81. And they had a health care insurance. And I went to them and I said, listen, save your money. They said, what? I said, take your insurance off of us. What? You don't want our insurance. To them, it's foolishness. I said, no. I said, I got to keep my faith alive and active. You see, if I, if I don't have insurance, then I've got to trust God or I'm dead. And my wife was in agreement. So from that moment to this time, we've never, ha never had health insurance. Wow. Never had it. Didn't need it. Because <laughs> Jesus is the healer. It, it, was, it was like oh, uh, four weeks ago now that I was hit. With, and I've been hit with kidney stones before. And I got hit with kidney stones. But this time it was, it, it was it, and, 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 and I have a friend of mine who ha has been in the medical world. He's retired now. His wife helped lead worship here. And uh, my wife was over there, and I called him up, and I told him what I was going through. And, and he said, not only do you have kidney stones, he said, your kidneys are infected. I said, okay, well, thank you. Well, so I'm standing on the word of God. You know, Pete came over and prayed for me. I mean, I was so hit by the devil, I couldn't, I couldn't get out of my bed. My teeth were chattering, weren't they, Pete? I'm, I'm just, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm in the hang of bed. It's a fight of faith, you know. And, for, and, and from, from, from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, now we had men's prayer that meeting that night. And I said, I'm going to prayer tonight. You know, I'm going to pray. I don't get out of the pulpit no matter what the devil is doing to me physically. I'm going to preach all these years, you know. So, so at 3 o'clock, the Spirit of God, I mean, it just hit me. It didn't get rid of all the infirmities, but I was able to get up out of bed. I could stand. But during that time, I, I had puked in my mouth and got this acidic stuff in my mouth. It infected my mouth. I couldn't hardly eat anything for a week. And then my, 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 uh, it was my left ankle went out, and then my right kneecap went out, and my mouth is infected, and my kidneys are infected, and kidney stones, and I'm so weak. And what are you doing? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That coming Sunday I preached. Listen, I'm telling you, by the next Sunday I was completely, totally healed. Yeah. Completely healed. Yeah. Completely. I mean, the devil's a liar. I mean, I, I can tell you story after story where I had to fight the fight of faith and do what the Word of God said. But you know what? Part of it is my thought life. My mind don't think like normal people. I'm sorry, I'm just not normal. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not. I'm just not normal. I just don't think like normal people, you know. He says, listen, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. And, and uh, he says in verse 8, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. God doesn't. Look at Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. God doesn't do it the way we do it. And God's way is better. 
You know, it's like there's a law of gravitation, but when I was a pilot, the, the law of aerodynamics overcomes the law of gravitation. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus overcomes the law of sin and death. It overcomes it. So I, I, uh, I just, you know, I, I was, somebody uh, wanted me to, uh, they wanted me, they wanted to know if I ever dealt with the subject of false grace and real grace. So I, I did a, a YouTube search and I found a video I did back in 2013 on real grace and false grace. Well, I, I listen to myself, I do. And, and if, if I find something in there that's wrong, then I just readjust my theology because every day I'm getting more and more truth as I'm spending time on the Word of God. Well, I told a story because we have a 250-foot radio tower over there, and uh, it's only 18 inches wide. It was during the winter time, and our light went out in uh, 2013. Our light went out. Now, the FCC and the FAA, they're going to give you a fine, and usually planes don't fly under 500 feet, but if they did, they'd run into my tower because I didn't have a light. And so I took some young, young bucks down there with me. This was back when I was 57 years old. I, and, and, and I've lost 50 pounds since January, but I was overweight, about 20 pounds overweight. And so I got down there, and I really didn't want to climb that tower being 57. Now, I've climbed that tower many times in my early years, you know, and because and, and we, we, something would go wrong, and I, I'd just climb it and fix it myself. And it's not because I, 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 heights don't bother me. It's just I did it by faith. See, I just did it by faith. Well, this young buck, he, he, he said, I'll go up there, Pastor Mike. I was really concerned. I said, are you sure? He's probably in his 30s or 20s. He said, I can do it. I said, okay, go ahead. So we put the climbing equipment on him. And you really don't have climbing equipment doing a tower because you've got your guide wires and you've got to hook up and unhook. You can't stay hooked in. And so he gets up 50 feet, and I look up, and he's hyperventilating, man. I could tell he was... He wasn't going to make it. I said, come on down, come on down. So he comes down, and it's cold out, too. And so uh, finally he tells me, I can do it, I can do it. I said, okay, now listen to me. You get up there, you're going to have to fix the problem because our side lights and our top lights were not working. And it was all electrical problems. So he gets up there 75 feet. He's up there for three minutes, and then he, he can't handle it. So he comes down. And so now I knew I had to go up. I knew it. But I thought, well, I'm going to get a new climbing harness and so I ordered a new climbing harness. Three days later, it's still cold out. The lights are off. I know the FAA, the FCC is going to give us a fine. So I get down there and I begin to climb, you know, and I'm 57 years old, 20 pounds overweight. You know, I'm not. And usually, even in my younger years, when I was in my 30s, if I would climb that 250-foot tower, when I came down, every muscle in my body would hurt for days on end because you're working your legs, your arms. I mean, you're... <laughs> 255 feet up there, and I would get Charlie Horse, and, and for a week I'd walk around like this, you know. <laughs> I mean, I was all cramped up. And so I just, I said, well, I got to climb that tower. So, you know, and I got up there 75 feet and fixed that light condition, and I got up to the very top, and I found out, wow, it's going to take, I got to redo all of the electric work up here. And, and I was an electrician in the Navy, and so thank God I had, uh, I had enough wisdom to have like a roll of rope with me that was long enough, and so I would drop it, and they would put the, the wire on it and the equipment I needed, and I'd pull it up. Well, listen, man, this thing's taking forever to do this. I'm freezing. My hands are becoming like claws. I got a utility knife. I'm up there for three hours, Pete. And the wind is blowing and the sun is setting. Listen, I'm up there at the top of this tower and I'm just crying out to God because when I'm weak, then I'm a strong. And all of a sudden, the spirit of God hit me. The grace of God hit me. I'm up there 250 feet getting drunk in the Holy <laughs> Ghost. <laughs> I'm at the top of this tower for three hours. The glory of God is on me on the top of this tower. I didn't want to come down. So I'm up there, and I finally fix it, the sudden setting. Listen, I got up the next morning. Listen, not only did I not get any cramps, but all of my afflictions, every single one of them, the stomach affliction, the knee affliction, the foot affliction, it was all gone, and I was completely healed. <laughs> you know why? Because you walk by faith. And so he says, my ways are not your ways. See, that's not the way of a natural man. A natural man who's got ankle problems and knee problems and stomach problems in the middle of winter don't climb a 250-foot tower if he's got any brains. <laughs> but see, I, I, don't, I, I don't think like natural men. I think like the Word of God says. And, and, and he tells us, listen, 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, now that's not talking about the atmosphere, that's talking about the, the, the galaxies and the solar system, the universe. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what are his thoughts right here? It's right here, people. He sent his word and he healed them. For, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Then it tells us what's going to be the results when we repent when we see it the way that God sees it, when we do it the way that God does it, when we, we walk it out the way that God does it, it says there, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring uh, forth and bud, that it may give unto seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. So shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It's the word of God, people. It's the word of God alive in our hearts. No, no, it's going to be a battle get, to get the word of God there. I mean, the, the enemy is always trying to distract me, always trying to pull me this way or that way. And I've got to bring myself back to the word of God, back to the truth. Back to the reality of Christ. I've got to. I've got to hide the word of God in my heart every day. And, 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 and I wish I could tell you, well, it must be gotten pretty easy for you since you've done it all these years. Oh, no, it's a fight. I know how powerful. I know how awesome. I know what the word of God can do within a human heart. But the enemy, he knows it too. And so he's going to try to keep us out of the word of God as much as he can. Because we become a threat to him. The more of the truth, you know, the weapons of our warfare are really in Ephesians built upon nothing but the word of God. The breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Above all, the shield of faith, your feet sod with the preparations, the gospel of peace, your loins girt about with truth. That's all the word of God. It's called the armor of light. You, you, you hide that word of God in your heart. Now, I know some people get up in the morning, they act like the, I'm putting on the helmet of salvation, I'm putting on, you know, my shoes. No, no, that, that's, no, no, no. That, that, it's the word of God in your heart. Just because you're acting like you're putting a helmet on doesn't mean you got a helmet on. See, that word of God is protecting your mind. That word of God is, is, is your breastplate. It's your, it, it's your, your sword. It's everything you need. It's, it, it, that's why God gave you his word. And it says, this is, this is what's going to happen. It says, that, it says, for you shall go out with joy. <laughs> you will be led forth with peace. And this is your attitude. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. The mountains and the hills shall break before you in the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is God revealing himself to the human race. So, you know, before I joined the Navy, um, I lived in Wisconsin, but I'd run around with guys in Chicago in the Racine area where they had all those riots. And they were not good guys. Oh, yeah, we hunted, we fished, but we also stripped cars, we stole, uh, did parties. They, they, they did immoral things I won't talk about, and, and I didn't do it with them. But I got in trouble with them, with the law, and at 16 years old, uh, got caught with drugs, not drugs, but alcohol in my car. And they gave me a choice. I quit school at 15. They said, you can join the military if you want to get out of uh, being prosecuted. And, and so I, I chose to join the Navy. Well, they didn't want me, so we had to go back a number of times and convince them they needed me. But when they got me, they found out they shouldn't have never, they should have never, should have never had me. But, 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 I, I, but anyway, so when I got born again three months before I got out of the military, uh, because it was only like they had like after basic training and after your schooling and everything else, and it was like a two-year hitch, you know. And so I, I got out of the Navy, and the Spirit of God led me to go back to try to reach those guys. Well, you know, some of the hardest people to reach are people you, that know you. Well, I got back, and I'm not preaching to them. I'm just sharing Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm just, 
And, and so they're doing the drugs, the alcohol, and they're doing everything they're doing. And, 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 and I'm just preaching Jesus to them. I made them miserable. I know what was going on. And, and so one day I'm coming up with the two main leaders, Claire and Gary. And now Gary, he had been up to the big house, the federal prison. And, and these were big men. I mean, these, uh, Claire was so, he was so massive. I seen him do this. I saw him pick a V8 engine that we disconnected from the transmission and dropped off the pipes and the, and, and the, and, and the uh, uh, exhaust system. I seen him grab it and pull it up out of a car. I mean, this, this uh, massive this guy was. Now, you'd think this guy would protect me because he was supposed to have been my friend from Gary. I never liked Gary. He, he was just wild. You couldn't trust Gary. I mean, Gary would kill someone in a heartbeat. I had been with those guys when they had gunfights, shooting at people, shooting at us, and us shooting back at them. So they, they were nothing to mess with. So we're coming out of Chicago, and we're in like this old Bel Air, or we're in this old Chevy with the, remember the steel dashes? Now, some of you can't remember. They were gone before you were even a, a sparkle in your mom and daddy's eyes, you know. But up on the dash, they had the old heating vents. Well, here, Gary had hit a great big old homemade knife in, in the dash. And we're coming down. It's summertime, probably July. The windows are down. I'm sitting between them, you know. I'm in the Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, Gary reaches up. And I seen him. I went into his, 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 the realm of the Spirit where everything slows down. And he reached up and grabbed that big old butcher knife. And he pulls it out. Watch. And I'm watching him. And he lifts it up. Now, Gary is going to cut me to, he's going to kill me. That's what he was going to do. He's going to just stab me to death, throw me in some sewage pit somewhere, and no one ever would know what happened to Mike Yeager. So I watched him, and he took the knife, and I'm, I'm watching the knife come down from my gut. He's going to pin me to the chair. I, I'm sitting there just watching this, like in La La Land. I watch my hands come up and grab his wrist. And this is a big, husky dude. I mean, this guy, I'm not exaggerating, he's over six feet, just built like an ox. And that knife, I watch it, and I couldn't stop it from coming down, but it went right down between my legs, very close, you know, to my leg. And it went all the way down to the hilt into the chair through the springs. And then again, and then again, three to five times. This, he is trying to stab me to death. I'm just watching this, right? I'm just like, wow, what's happening? Now listen, during this whole time, my heart is not skipping a beat. No fear, no anxiety. It's like I'm in heaven, man. That's how it is when you're moving in the spirit. <laughs> it's so wonderful, and that's where we're supposed to be living. Walk in the spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So a cop car comes around the corner, he throws the knife out the window, right? Now, I'm sitting there. My, I, it's just like I'm at a picnic. They, Gary and, 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 and Claire, they just look straight ahead, and they're just driving. I'm just sitting there with a big old smile on my face. Like, I didn't even know what happened. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm gone, man. I'm in the spirit. Well, the very next day, now the Lord spoke to me, told me now, get on a plane and go to Alaska. And I ended up with the Yupik Indians. Uh, if you ever heard, how many ever heard of Todd Palin, Todd and Sarah Palin? Okay, that, that town, I flew in that town and I worked with Todd Palin when he was about a 10, 12 year old kid. And I worked, if you ever seen the most dangerous catch, I worked on fishing boats, halibut and salmon boats up in the Bering Sea and also off of the coast of the uh, uh, state of Washington and Oregon. But anyway, so the next day I had to go do something at Gary's house. So I went to Gary and Gary had a 12 gauge shotgun laying up against the wall uh, on the porch of his house, a covered porch. I'm coming up the sidewalk. Gary grabs that 12-gauge shotgun. I, I just, the Spirit of God was on me. I just, he aimed it right at my gut. Listen, and he shot me. He pulled the trigger, and it went off. But nothing happened to me. <laughs> I, and, and once again, my heart is just filled with peace and calm. I walked up, grabbed the gun out of his hand. He had to be shocked. Because I just took the gun out of his hand. I leaned it up against the house, did whatever I had to do in this house. I left and I never seen him again. But see, we just read there, you'll be led forth with peace, joy. I mean, you, you, it'll be just like you're walking in heaven on earth. Did you know you can live in a place in the spirit 
of heaven on earth. Amen. Did you get something tonight? Amen.